Good morning. Welcome back. My name is Jim Kelly, and I am uh, the Executive Director and Information Security Officer for Mission Health here in Asheville. And um, I have the uh, pleasure of serving on the uh, Cybersecurity Advisory Council here at Montree College. So in, really enjoy that role. I'd love to ask if we could shove to the center a little bit. Um, it, it would be great for our speaker. We got, we've got about 100 people in the room, and we have uh, a room that's fit for 1,400. So um, the, the, the better we can move to the middle, the better it's going to be for uh, collaboration and, and, and listening here. So I appreciate your, your help with that. I know everyone's comfortable, and, and uh, so I'm disrupting your day. I apologize. but. Uh, while you're moving, I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Dan Wilson is a cybersecurity risk analyst with AIG. He has over 15 years of experience in IT security. Within AIG, Mr. Wilson currently serves as a subject matter expert on cyber risks and solutions, acting as a technical resource for AIG underwriters, brokers, and clients. Mr. Wilson's team, teams provide uh, services that include ethical hacking, application security assessments, incident response planning, IT forensics, malware defense, and security policy. Prior to joining AIG, Mr. Wilson worked in for IBM as a leader of the North American X-Force Cybersecurity Assessment and Response Team. His practice was responsible for helping clients take a proactive, approach towards preparing for and reducing the risks associated with cybersecurity incidents. Mr. Wilson is a certified CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, with a bachelor's in computer science from Brigham Young University and an MBA from Regis University. Please join me in welcoming Dan Wilson. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, as mentioned, uh, I've had a lot of experience in seeing a lot of different companies in both a reactive and a proactive state. As you've already heard today, um, the different scenarios and things that can occur around an organization, especially depending on the industry you're in, the systems that you're in, the data that you have, it's, it's fascinating to think about, to put on your maniacal brain for a moment and think what are the real possibilities and what could realistically happen and what can I do about it? And that's an important element, but really what I'm here to talk about more today is even more focused on the proactive side of that. There are a lot of organizations that struggle with understanding what really is cyber risk. The technical folks have one view of that, the business folks have another. What's it gonna cost if some of these scenarios and things happen? And what's the best way to plan and prepare for that so that I am doing the best to protect my business to make sure something is not gonna cause me to fail or really just take me out and cause harm to employees, to people I serve, or whatever the case may be. There's a lot of ramifications of that. And so that's what I'm here to present about today. Having been in the past in the technical trenches and knowing where my brain was and where I am now, I think you are starting to see a slow evolution in the cybersecurity world. And I'm hoping today that I can help talk and present some of that message that I'm starting to see so that you can walk away from this presentation today with maybe helping to accelerate that approach because I think it's better than some of the things that we have been doing in the past in the security world. So let me explain that. So, as I go through this, I want to ask yourself, have you asked yourself three questions? Number one, how do you define cyber risk? If you're a technical person, again, you might have one answer. If you are a business person, you might have another. If you go to a security conference like this, um, for example, like at RSA, and you go into the vendor hall and you see the 800 some odd different security vendors sitting there, you're going to get 800 different answers. And so it's confusing. So what is cyber risk? How do I define that? What is the cost? Is it just the investment and the tools and the processes and the people that I need to put in place to protect the business? What is the cost of the result incident that occurs? Is it the cost of 
a record per record, we see that around $280 or so per record in a data breach, is that the average cost of an incident of three and a half million, you know, what really is the cost and how do I quantify and prepare for that? And then lastly, what really does it mean to put a strategy in place? Does it mean I follow the framework I'm supposed to or forced to? Uh, what can I do to be proactive and, and protect my business? So that's what I want you to think about as we go through this. So let me start first by maybe delving in a little bit to the background of, of what I'm trying to present to you today. Again, I've been to a lot of different organizations and I've, I've seen a lot of different things. There's nothing more stressful than walking into a boardroom that's a company's in the middle of dealing with an incident like what you heard this morning and you see and feel you could almost reach out and touch the stress that's in the room and the worry and the concern for their business and that's what we want to avoid. So here's what I typically see. Organizations for the last 10 to 15 years have looked at cybersecurity and they've said the IT department's got it. That's their problem. And you see as a result of that boardrooms that uh, put their heads in the sand or even maybe say, you know what, we're in an industry where we're not targeted. We don't see these things happening, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm confident in our IT guys. I know they're doing the right things. And it's not even part of the regular strategy discussion that they have at that level. And so what does that do? Well, that creates a personality, if you will, in the IT team, and it adds to it. And I call this the IT mentality. And if you're in IT, please don't be offended. I've been there. I've been this guy too. <laughs> so uh, we all see in the IT world this desire to be the smartest guy in the room. We relish the challenge. We love technology. We eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We love the fact that we can help a company be more efficient we can improve business process. We can save the company dollars by instituting technology. And oh, by the way, we can solve world hunger if you just give us enough time and the right technology. That's who we are. That's our makeup. That's what we love to do. So when the executive board says, you guys got cybersecurity, this is your problem, we go, great, we got this. And that's not bad. There's nothing wrong with that per se but it's really not the whole solution. And, and what we really know behind the scenes is the IT people, we know where all the weaknesses are. We know where we put the duct tape and the, the chewing gum and the things to kind of hold this environment together that the executives think is wonderful. And that's not always the case. You know, some things, times things are really running well. But I'll give you an example. You know, 20 years ago when I was a sysadmin, we had this problem because the application that we were running and we found that every day we had to run this little batch job just to clear out the, the CPU cycles, the memory, kind of refresh the server without taking anything down. And so we were running this thing every day. Well, of course, we weren't telling managers and executives about that. You know, that's, we're making things work. That's our job. But it's also a weakness. If that goes down, what happens to the business? And that's where this IT mentality sometimes causes risk to the business because we have a tendency to want to hide or mask where the weaknesses are, especially when it comes to cybersecurity. We don't want to give any information out that may potentially provide an advantage to the bad guy. We especially don't want the world to know that we experienced an incident unless we have to report it. So we don't share. We don't help others with things that we have learned from. It's, it's challenging to get beyond that. And that really puts all the focus back on the IT team, the CISO, and if something goes wrong, guess who takes the blame? The average lifespan right now of a CISO is two to three years. So you can imagine where that blame gets focused. So if we take that and couple that with this growing threat landscape, it's been amazing to me, I'm gonna date myself a little bit, but my first computer was an Apple IIe. The amount of memory on that thing was 64K, and it was fabulous. I have more memory on my phone today and capability than I did with that thing. And I look at that, and the technology capabilities we had then to compare to even just 10 years ago, when I finally got my first smartphone, to even now. And I look at even just in my own home, 
where I now have a smart TV, I have a security system, I have a thermostat that I can manage from my cell phone, my sprinkler system. I could be here in North Carolina and turn my sprinklers off at home. I mean, there's so many different things that we can do that are great and cool technologies, and we are in incorporating all these things into our businesses as well. In our manufacturing lines, in our SCADA systems and managing utilities, you heard all about that this morning. I mean, there's a lot of things that we are automating, and because it improves the efficiency, it lowers the cost, and it makes us much better. But meanwhile, we are expanding the opportunity for the bad guys to get in, for them to do damage and disruption, and it makes it much more difficult for us to protect what really is going on in the environment. So what do I see as I visit businesses? And believe it or not, this is still the case in a lot of organizations. Less than a third of organizations today actually have an instant response plan in place. You heard him talk about that this morning. Less than a third. Those that I go to and visit that have a plan, a lot of those it's pull it off the shelf, blow it off, and wow, we haven't updated it for four years. And people named in that plan and moved on. So I would even garner it's less than that. So what usually do you see? You see companies that experience or practice a strategy of whack-a-mole, which is really just a fun way of saying they are highly reactive. Okay, they are looking at what's going on in the world and respond to it. Okay, here's a new technology, let's pull that in. Oh darn it, we had an incident, let's shore up our defenses so that we're better for the next time. There really isn't much proactive thought given to it. And the problem with this strategy is it can be highly costly, um, especially if I am responding to incidents and then expending a lot of dollars to shore up my defenses at that point. It is not ineffective, or it's not effective at all, it's highly ineffective. And it really leaves me much more susceptible to experiencing even a higher catastrophic level of a data breach or incident than an organization that is actively trying to better secure my organization. So whack-a-mole or make it rain. You don't see this one often, but once in a while you get a CISO that is charismatic, very good in convincing a board that he needs budget. Or maybe something did happen and now the board is more willing to give you budget. And so we go out and we buy a bunch of technologies. Um, we often refer to this in consulting as leave no security vendor behind. We're going to employ anything that we possibly can, especially if it's a cool new technology that we think is going to give us an edge. As a CISO, again, going back to RSA, if you walk onto a, that vendor floor and you went in there seriously with the mindset of what things do I need to incorporate in my strategy to protect my business, you would walk out of there highly overwhelmed and really having no clue because every security vendor says, I'm the silver bullet, install me, and you won't have to do anything else. And I'm sorry if there's any vendors in here that I've offended with that. <laughs> but that's the case. I used to be one at IBM, so I, I get it. But that, that's the reality. There is no silver bullet. But we try to apply and throw a bunch of money at it, especially boards that are concerned, and they want to fix the problem. And so they throw money at it, hoping that that will make a difference. But the problem is, at some point, they're going to start asking the question of, can you tell me where the return of my investment is? I've given you millions of dollars. How really are you protecting us? What's affecting the bottom line? And how can you assure me that we're doing the right things with the money that I'm giving you? I have to account for that on the board. And that's what they want to know. And heaven forbid, if something does happen after they've given you all that money, the questions become a lot harder. So this leads then to the decision. There's a lot of frameworks out there. And this is, I'm not dis, you know, putting a negative light on any framework, okay? They are good, and they should be involved in your strategy. The concern I have here is that I see a lot of organizations that are either A, forced to follow something like PCI or HIPAA, or B, they choose something like NIST or SIS or whatever the case may be, NERC SIP if you're doing utilities, and they follow that framework and they assume the guys that were smarter than me put that together, they know what I need to be doing, and so if I am following that framework, I'm good. Well, the problem is compliance with a framework is not security. We have seen it. People that have followed PCI for years have still suffered 
credit card breaches, even though they were compliant. People that are following NIST still suffer security incidents. It is not, again, the solution, but it is a contributor to what should be the strategy. And the biggest problem with the frameworks, and this is the one we need to talk about the most, is how do I translate as the CISO or the security or the IT team the language that I speak in in that framework to what the board understands and what they want to know. They want to know return on investment. They want to know how you're protecting their financial strategy. Well, I can't go and report that I remediated 500 vulnerabilities and that we had this technical problem and that we're putting this in place. The board's going to look at you and go, what does that mean? So we need a way to translate that from the, the techies to the boardroom language. So where does all that leave us? So these are the current numbers that we see at AIG, some of the trends as of the middle of this year even. Cybercrime is continuing to grow. It's the number one issue. Um, FBI has estimated over five billion in the last four years have been lost due to cybercrime. That's just extortion attempts. That does not include ransomware or other things like that. We are now reaching the threshold of trillions in cost annually in cybersecurity. That's the incident resulting costs. We are seeing a continual rise in the number of incidents per year. It has not slowed down at all. Billions of data records are lost every year. Last year, you take away Equifax, it's still billions, okay? That number has not slowed down either. And of course, on top of all this, the employees continue to be the weakest link. Despite our best efforts to train, to help people be aware, to understand which links not to click on, they still do. It's getting better, but studies show that every company still has 4%, that one or two people that will click anything, no matter what we do. So it's a problem. In 2017, 978 million people in 20 countries were affected by cybercrime. Think about that. That number is increasing in 2018. Here's just a picture of what we see at AIG. At AIG, with our cyber insurance that we sell, obviously we process claims, so we get to see a lot of what's happening in the business world. Just look at the last five years here, from 2013 to 2017, you'll see the number of claims in the first four years actually equal the number of claims we had last year in 2017. That's interesting. To put it in a better perspective, we currently process five claims a day at AIG. So clearly what we've been doing to this point is great, but it's not fully working. There's got to be a better way. Um, we're losing the war, I guess you could say. The bad guys are staying a couple steps ahead. Um, what really is the answer? And I don't know that there's a full-on answer, but I know there is kind of the next evolution, if you will. You know, 10 years ago, as everything was you know, layers of defense, put it all together, build your the layers and everything will be fine. Defense in depth, and then it became all about AI, and that's kind of the newest trend. But really you're starting to see this, again, an evolution of risk is no longer the IT department's problem. And it's evolving to where boardrooms are starting to realize that cyber is truly a business risk. And what does that mean? Well, let's, let's talk about that now. So, Again, what is cyber risk? If I'm a technical person, I am probably gonna look at this a little bit differently. My job is to ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the systems that I have been within my charge, and my responsibility. In other words, I need to make sure that the business runs, that the data on them stays pure, and that uh, nothing bad gets in. That's my job. So to me, risk means uh, systems need to be up to date, vulnerabilities need to be remediated, I need to have good backup power in case there's power failure, I need to have redundancy. All of those things are what I look at as a technical concern in maintaining my responsibility. How does the boardroom look at it? They don't understand that. A lot of them don't. And so they're looking at it from the perspective of what is the financial risk to my business? If something goes down, if we're breached, what's the impact to me financially? How does that affect the bottom line? What is gonna be the hit to our reputation? Name brand is everything. 
Look at what happened with Equifax last year and how they handled their incident. Look at what happened with Target when they were hit with their breach on Black Friday. They lost millions because of it. What's the strategic risk? Am I doing the right things? What's the operational risk? How's it gonna affect my ability to produce and increase my revenues? That's what they are looking for. And so the question is, how do we translate all of that together so that we are producing what really is cyber risk, which involves all of this? We have learned over the last many years that any cyber incident will affect all of this in a business capacity and in the, affect them in a risk capacity. So let's take a look at an example, just to maybe put a little bit more cost numbers behind what we're talking about here. So this is an actual claim that we processed last year. Ransomware was huge in 2017. They seem to affect uh, healthcare and municipalities especially. So this was a municipality that experienced a ransomware attack. The ransomware was successful in compromising all of their servers. So they were completely down. Their critical systems, data, services that they provide is all down. Uh, they were extorted or requested 40 bitcoins, which at the time was $24,000 US equivalent for the ransom to get the key that they could decode and get their systems back online. So in a situation like this, what are the costs that that organization is now faced with? Well, number one, there's the event management costs. I need to hire general counsel, maybe even a breach coach if I don't have that skill set. Um, I need to look at third party forensics help because I need to figure out how this happened, uh, get a timeline built, how to contain it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, and then there's also the cost of public relations. Um, again, we look at Equifax last year as what not to do when it comes to getting the message out publicly. Um, am I managing that message in the right way? Potentially, I need a firm to help me with that. So in this case, those costs rolled up to be a million dollars, rounded. Uh, they paid the ransom payment, so there's a cost of 24000 But then there's also system downtime. While my systems are down, I am not producing, I am not bringing revenue in. My employees are sitting idle for the most part. Um, and that brings costs into my organization. That costs them another million. So here we have a simple ransomware case. Well, I say simple, but it, it really, it cost them over $2 million in real costs just to deal with that scenario. Now, this one didn't have some of the other things that you will typically see for example, in a data breach, I'm gonna have costs for client notifications and credit monitoring. Uh, most regulations require a free year of credit monitoring to anybody affected. Um, there could be regulatory fines. PCI, HIPAA, some regulations will actually impose fines upon you depending on the nature of the breach and the extent of it. Uh, litigation. Uh, there's been a lot of news lately about uh, litigation for Yahoo and, and things from previous incidents that have occurred. And other recovery expenses. For example, in this case, if they had not paid the ransom, how much would it have cost to have all of their system analysts, their security folks, probably some third party support to come in and rebuild everything and put it back all together? I can give you an example of that. We did that when I was at IBM for another company that experienced a similar, similar situation. In their case, we had to help rebuild the manufacturing line systems, all their servers, their end user systems, everything. And they had a price tag of 10 million from IBM just to get that done, in addition to all their employee costs. So it can be extensive. The average cost currently for a data breach is 3.86 million. That comes from the Ponymon Institute. If you're not familiar with them, their whole mission in life is to try and measure the cost of the incident and various factors around that. So that's where that number comes from. It's a US number. But here are some of the other things that uh, don't factor into that. Um, reputational damage. How do you quantify that? Sometimes you can see it in stock drops. Sometimes you can see that in other elements that we can quantify. But it really is hard to quantify specifically what your reputational damage will hit will be. That's why companies won't ensure that. But you can see the stop price drop and quantify that. Equifax took a huge hit last year 
So did Yahoo, so has Google recently, so has Facebook. Um, revenue losses, you know, my systems are down, I'm not bringing revenue in. Uh, potential future revenues that I would have accrued maybe are lost because of reputational loss. Uh, contract cancellations, customer churn. There's a lot of things that can come into play that we don't necessarily have the ability to put a full finger on. The hidden costs are estimated to be actually 103% of the actual cost. So you can essentially take your 3.86 million average and double that for a security incident. And that's the reality. And this is what boardrooms are concerned about. This is what keeps them up at night when they think about cyber affecting their business. So all of that now finally, we're to the point of what I wanted to talk about today, and that is it's time for this evolution, this paradigm shift in cybersecurity to take place. It's time for us maybe to set our hero cape aside a little bit and to realize that we're good, but we can't do it alone. And there's a much better way to build a strategy to protect our business. And so for a CISO, this might mean reaching out of the, the silo for a minute and trying to figure out who's the risk manager. Up till a couple of years ago when I joined AIG, I had no idea what a risk manager was. I couldn't tell you what their function was. Their whole job in life, they have studied, they've gone to school, they understand business risk, strategies, and mitigation. That's their whole role. So why not take advantage of that expertise? Number two, we need to get CISOs out of the technical ranks and up to where the C-level should be. There's too many organizations where the CISO still reports to the CIO or the legal counsel or somebody else. They need to report to the CEO and the board. And so when we do that, when we elevate the CISO role, that puts the strategy at a higher level and that puts the executive leadership and the board behind it. And then number three, we need a system that translates what we do in the technical ranks, that we can measure that and report it in business terms, not just technical terms. And we're starting to see that shift. Um, I find it interesting that over the last two to three years, when I look at what security vendors are using as their marketing techniques, a lot of them are starting to use the term risk now. But again, the problem is, as a vendor, if I tell you I solve cyber risk and I'm a vulnerability scanner, well, I'm helping you solve an element of cyber risk, but I'm not really helping you solve business cyber risk. And that's the question that we need to ask. So how do we go about putting a strategy together? The first thing we need to do is understand, and this is at a high level, what are the critical data and assets that I have in my environment? You'd be surprised how many organizations still do not have an inventory. I know that's a challenge today with IOT, with BYOD, all these acronyms that we throw out there for the ever expanding number of systems that we put on our network. But a lot of folks don't really know everything that's out there, what's on their network, and that's a challenge. And if you look at CIS, that's number one on the list is know what's in your environment. But especially in this case, know what's critical. Okay, there's a difference between my sandbox server and my server that holds the formula for Coke. Okay, there's a difference in that. One of them is highly more critical than the other. And that's really what we're talking about here. What is the impact to my business? Once I understand that landscape, what is the impact to my business if any one of those things go down? And I need to prioritize that. Um, if the formula for Coke is breached or that server goes down, what does that mean? Versus maybe a system that HR logs into, you know, maybe the HR system can go for a couple of days being down and we'll be fine versus if my web presence and uh, revenue capabilities go down. So there's a huge difference and I need to understand that and prioritize accordingly. And then I can start to formulate my strategy. How much do I have available to invest in technology in the people and in the processes we need to create? And what are the right technologies and things that we should invest in? And as we make that decision, we should also consider, again, and this is where the risk manager can come into play, how much of that should I look at cheaper options? And I'm not trying to sell insurance here, I'm not an insurance sales guy, but there really is validity in looking at coverage 
as a cheaper way to manage some of the lower and lesser risks that I have. And all of that should be incorporated into the overall strategy that I put together. And then of course, this constantly needs to be reevaluated. Just like anything else, I can't do it once and expect that it's gonna go for the next six years. Okay, I need to reevaluate at least annually, hopefully more. So what I'd like to do now is give you an example. I'm gonna show you what we do at AIG. This is not an opportunity to commercialize, so I don't want you to take it that way. I want you to look at it more from perspective of, here is a way that we have put things together to help organizations accomplish this. And you can take elements away from it and build your own, um, you know, do whatever you'd like, but the key tenets that we just talked about are really what's most important. So at AIG, when I sit down with a client, there are three questions that I often get asked. Number one, can you tell me what my risk profile looks like? You're an insurance company, tell me what, industry, based on the industry I'm in, based on my business, really where are the concerns, what should I be doing to protect myself? Number two, they wanna know how they compare against their peers. All businesses wanna know that. And number three, can you tell me the actual costs? You process a lot of claims, you see a lot of things. What realistically is this gonna cost me? I don't think I'm gonna be a target. I don't think I'm the small mom and pop shop. I'm somewhere in between what's the reality for me so I know how to plan accordingly. That's what they wanna know. So in this model, we give them an assessment to start with. And the assessment facilitates a lot of what I talked about just a moment ago. We ask them questions about who they are, what systems they have in place, what their financials look like, um, and, and really start to build that profile. If I'm in healthcare, I'm gonna have a different risk profile than if I'm in real estate. If I'm in manufacturing versus education, there are differences to the data types that I have to prevent or protect, the uh, regulations that I deal with, the amount of attacks that I'm gonna see because of my profile or size, all of that factors in. So I've gotta understand that. Then we need to compare that to the threats that are out there. In our model, we've actually summarized everything down into 10 common scenarios. And you'll see those in a minute, but it's things like a ransomware threat, a data breach, a denial of service. What is the reality of those threats? And they're constantly evolving and changing, so we're constantly adjusting this, but we wanna give them an idea of how those threats apply to them based on their profile. And then we ask them those questions. Let's go through the impacts. If these systems go down, do you suffer losses within minutes, within hours, within days? What is the, when does that impact start to affect you? And that helps us help them prioritize, but also understand where the higher risks are gonna be as these threats occur. All those three things help us build, first of all, the risk profile. So based on that, we understand here is what your risk is before you do anything else. And here are the things that are gonna affect you the most. Then we start looking at all their controls. What do they put in place? What is gonna mitigate some of those risks? Um, what are the things that they are doing to protect their business? And essentially at a high level behind all of this with a lot of the analytics that's going off, you could really say that we're taking uh, threats times impacts minus controls is really what we're doing at a very high level, but there's a lot more depth to that. And that's what we're doing to create, after we account for the controls, any remaining risk that they still need to look at and deal with. So this gives you an idea of the output that we provide to them. And this is where organizations really could benefit in creating something like this after they've reviewed their systems and their impacts, put together a heat map. Where are we most susceptible in our business? Where are our highest likelihoods of threats to occur? And where do we need to focus our energies and our efforts in our current strategy to better protect and lower those risks? As you can see from this example, the client in this case has a much higher likelihood of a web application attack and a denial of service attack. Those are the highest numbers, okay? So if I'm a CISO and a risk manager, I am gonna drill into that and I'm gonna to want to know what are we doing 
to mitigate those risks and protect our business, especially in that pace, place. This gives you an idea now of a similar grid. We have now taken a look at their risk profile. We've applied all the controls that they have in place, and here's where they still have risk remaining. You will never get to zero. So when you see the zeros in the rows there, that means they don't have those devices. So this was not a healthcare provider, okay? Um, everybody, I think, understands that there is no way to get 100% perfect, right? So we don't account for zero. But the lower I get, the number, the better. That means I'm doing the right things. And really what we're saying here with residual risk is you still have risk in these areas and there are still controls and things that you can invest in to improve and lower that so that you are less likely a target and less susceptible to an attack. And then of course that gives me as a CISO the opportunity to now take a look at that and go, great. I now have the justification for the budget I need here are the things that I've prioritized that we need to invest in. And as I take that to the board and I speak to them in terms of likelihood, residual risk, and things like that, they are gonna understand that and they're gonna better support, yes, here are the things that you can do to better protect our business, we're gonna invest in that. So I basically build out my strategy and my roadmap for that. And I also get the opportunity to measure on how I'm doing. So in our model, we produce a maturity score for them, which is essentially the risk minus the controls. Here's your maturity percentage. And what we're really helping the client understand is, am I investing, are my investments aligned with the risk that I have, where my highest risks are? Because if they're not, if I'm just investing in technology willy-nilly and I have this really huge risk over here that's not lowering at all, then I'm not doing the right things. And that's what we're trying to help them formulate in their strategy. So again, maturity, residual risk threat likelihood. And something like this is really easy for a board to look at and go, great, I understand it, I know where I'm at. We can also give them things like this. And I think this is the most important measurement that we can give to a board. And there's ways to go about this. We do it based on our claims numbers. You can use the Ponymon's numbers and try to apply some cost metrics. Um, however you approach it is fine. But really what we're showing here is how likely am I to be infected or affected by something? What's the reality again? And what is that cost gonna look like to me? So as you can see from this graph here with this client, the likelihood of experiencing catastrophic breach is really very small. It's less than 2%, it's less than a percent really, okay? But I do have a high likelihood of experiencing something around 10,000 records, which can be costly. And so that's really where I should probably think in terms of my strategy and how I am protecting my business, what investments I should make, how much risk transfer I should look at, and combining all that together. And I now have a much better picture. And as I apply different controls and put my strategy in place, I can continually report to the board as to how this evolves and changes. So one last thing at AIG, we take this and we now automate it for the client. And this is something really, I, I put this out there just to emphasize the fact that this needs to be a continual process. A lot of boards want monthly reports, some of them want quarterly. However the way you do it, keep all of that data updated, especially the biggest thing is to show return on investment. I can report directly to the board now because my maturity score is improving, because the likelihood is decreasing, because costs are lowering, that you are getting return on your investment. We are a much better risk, and our business should not be affected negatively because of the things that we are doing. That's what the board wants to hear. So as I get ready to wrap up here, Again, I, I didn't want to commercialize AIG, so please don't take that away. I wanted to use that as an example to give you an idea of what boards are looking for. CISOs love that. They get the opportunity to see the, the technical and put the strategy and the roadmap together. It helps them justify the budget dollars that they need. The board loves it because it translates from the technical into the terms that they can understand and easily decipher. And that's really what we want to get to. So if you take nothing else away from this presentation, please take away that we need to break down the walls that exist between IT and some of the other business functions that are there, risk management, uh, legal, HR, financial. All of us should be working together to formulate what really is the cyber risk strategy for our business. 
pick a standard. Whatever framework you have to adhere to, whatever you prefer, it doesn't matter, but pick a standard that you're gonna follow. Don't think that is the end all be all, but focus on that as a start. Assess your risk, where are my critical assets and data, what's the impact, and prioritize accordingly. And then define your strategy collectively, hopefully at the executive level, where you will have executive buy-in and support because that means your culture is gonna improve, everybody's gonna be on the same page, and we are now working all together, moving in the same direction as an organization to protect the business. And then lastly, measure and report. That's where businesses struggle the most. They get all of this up to this point and then struggle to figure out how do we continually measure ourselves against how we're doing. So with that, we have about 10 minutes left. Any questions? Yes. We actually do both, okay? So we look at, first of all, the claims, everything that's coming in, everything that we're processing and handling, that internal data. We do re produce reports that we can give to anybody, but mostly we also feed that data back into our risk model so that we are constantly adjusting the threat landscape based on that. For example, last year in our risk model, first half of the year, ransomware was very high on the threat list. It dropped a little bit towards the end of the year. It's starting to creep back up. So we're constantly prioritizing and adjusting that threat landscape. But we also don't want to rely solely on that. You know, in cybersecurity, intelligence is an important aspect of it. So we do pull in other intelligence feeds. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We even pull from internally from our own IT security teams and what they're seeing on the AIG infrastructure itself. So yeah, it comes from all different facets. Other questions? Yes. How do I address it in the metrics? That, that's a good question. Um, it's one that a lot of folks have been trying to answer. I can. So the question was, there is the concern that a lot of organizations experience incidents that they don't report, that they don't share. How do we account for that in the metrics? Because um, that does change things, right? Um, Ponymon Institute's been trying to answer that question. Uh, the annual Verizon report's been trying to answer that question. There are a number of entities that are trying to make it so that you can report things and share things anonymously to try and increase the numbers that we're trying to calculate. At AIG, we get a little bit of advantage because we get a lot of claims reported that don't necessarily get publicly reported. So that gives us a little bit of an advantage there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you're right. We're never gonna know right now 100% of everything. And so with the likelihood threat likelihood numbers that we're putting in our model, we're still kind of having to base that off of what we are seeing in claims, what you hear about in trends that are the latest concerns that organizations are dealing with, what comes off the Verizon report and other intelligence information, and we adjust with what we know. Um, then we do add a little bit, and that kind of comes into the industry profile, where with what I know, if I'm a healthcare provider and they have been dealing with a ton of ransomware, even though I don't know everything, there's a higher likelihood that if you're a healthcare organization, you're probably gonna face a higher threat of ransomware than maybe somebody else. And so we adjust for it that way, but there's no way to be 100% certain, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Or is it, you know, 
Um, all of the above, yes. <laughs> okay, so four years ago, what was covered in cyber insurance is not even close to what is covered today. For example, four years ago, if I bought a cyber insurance policy, I could probably get coverage for some of the basic event expenses like third-party forensics, legal counsel, things like that. Um, maybe some third-party expenses, you know, if I were to be sued. And that would be about the extent of your coverage. Um, in the last two years, there's been a trend to add a lot more coverage, specifically around ransomware payments, cyber extortion, and crime itself. The big one is now business interruption. So it doesn't necessarily matter if it was a malicious threat that caused my systems to go down. Maybe it was just a sysadmin that made the mistake and I was down for a day, but that cost me a million in revenue. There's coverage for that now. And so, yes, part of that is the growth in insurance companies getting a better handle on what really are these costs that businesses are facing and putting that in the forms that they are providing with the coverage. But really a big part of that is also the continual growth in trends. And then the third element of that is the growth in people buying insurance. Four years ago, most people were highly suspect of cyber insurance. Some of them still are. There's a lot of people that think that cyber insurance is not gonna cover anything at all, and that's not true. Um, but there's been a growth and change in that paradigm also in the last couple of years that have increased the policyholder base. So yeah, all of that does factor in into those numbers. Yes? So to make sure I understand, you're asking if I don't follow a framework, I'm gonna have more difficulty getting insurance coverage versus somebody who is? Okay. Um, the answer to that is probably, it depends. I'll give you the consultant answer. <laughs> the main reason why is what we're really concerned about at AIG is we're not so much concerned about what framework you're following if you are or not. What we're more concerned about, again, as we looked at the model here is what is your risk level and what controls are you putting in place to mitigate that risk? So whether I'm following a framework or not, if I'm doing, I mean, you could even say I may not be following this, but I have my own plan. It may be your own framework. Really what we're focused on is the controls. What do I have in place that is protecting and mitigating that risk? That's more what we're focused on. Uh-huh. That's a whole nother problem. And I didn't highlight that strategy in this presentation, but you're right. There are businesses out there. His question was really around businesses today that think if I buy insurance, I'm covered. I don't have to worry about frameworks, controls, anything like that, because if something happens, the insurance company will pay for it. And that's great, but your coverage is only limited to so much. And is it really going to affect all the costs that you're gonna incur, let alone some of those hidden costs that we talked about? You really aren't protected just by having insurance. That's only an element of the strategy that you should have. So yeah, it, that's, that's another problem. Yeah, over here. That's a good question too. I have been amazed in the couple of years I've been in this position now at how difficult that is. We all seem to accept, and we all have admittedly so, this stigma about insurance, right? When I buy auto insurance, they look at my driving record. When I buy life insurance, they're gonna give me a physical. Heaven forbid they tell me I'm fat and that I can't get a good rate, right? So those things make a suspect of insurance in the first place. And in the cyber world, we talked about the IT mentality. We talked about CISOs not wanting to share. We don't want to expose our weaknesses. So why in the world would I allow an insurance carrier to come in and audit me? They're gonna find out that I'm worse 
than I think I am even, and they're gonna significantly increase my premium. And so what is happening in the market today is I can't get in to do that because clients are unwilling and because there are a number of carriers that are willing to insure you by simply asking four or five questions. So please tell me that by asking you what industry you're in, what your revenue is, how many data records you have, and whether or not you have a firewall, if that's good enough. But that's what carriers do today. <laughs> okay, so it, it really is a challenge. That's why we've put together this risk model and tried to provide a way for clients to self-assess and provide us at least more information that we can assess against and give them feedback. Yes? Uh-huh. And we answer it's not applicable. Because we use a form that's generic across multiple industries. Uh, what is the guidance to us uh, as business industry organizations? Uh, so do, do we just put not applicable uh, all the way down the form? Everything is not applicable. Are you working on forms that are more Correct, and, and that's been a problem to this point. So two things on that. Number one, at AIG, yes, we are working on that. In fact, if you fill out our application today, I said during my presentation, self-assessment, really what we're providing you is our application, which is a questionnaire now that has logic built into it. It's a PDF, smart PDF. So based on how I build my industry profile, it's gonna only add the questions that are applicable to me based on the system types that I have in my environment, it's only gonna ask questions about those systems. So you will not see questions that are not applicable. And even on top of that, we say, you know, here's the minimum set in the application that you only have to answer. Um, we don't have to answer the others if you don't want to. It's not gonna penalize you, but our feedback to you is not gonna be quite as accurate either. So that's number one, what we're doing at AIG. Number two, if you do have an application like that, I would recommend, as hard as it is, don't just answer not applicable, but maybe give a little bit of supplemental information in addition to why that's not applicable. Because your underwriters uh, did not grow up in security. Most of them grew up in finance and in business. They're doing the best they can to interpret the feedback that you're giving them. And if you just say not applicable, they don't necessarily know what that means and how to interpret. So a little bit more information and explanation would help when you do that. One last, oh, we're out of time? Okay, I'm sorry we're out of time. Um, if you'd like to catch me afterwards, go ahead and uh, thank you for your time.